The RMS Titanic in 1912, the very latest thing in shipbuilding. Her sinking shocked the world, but it continues to fascinate millions to this day. Like a giant 882 foot long time capsule, many parts of the ship have been frozen in time, telling different stories of the horrors experienced the night that the ship slipped beneath the waves. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today I've partnered with Titanic Honor and Glory to bring you the stories of five fascinating things found on the wreck of the Titanic. In April 1912, the brand new RMS Titanic was steaming across the Atlantic Ocean bound for New York City. We all know the story well. In just two short hours after grazing an iceberg, the ship had been lost along with over 1,400 of her passengers and crew. The wreck slammed into the sea floor and its secrets were held within for close to a century. And then, in 1985, when the wreck was rediscovered by Dr. Robert Ballard and his team, incredible artifacts and features from the ship were seen for the first time in seven decades. Since then, dozens of expeditions have been mounted to the wreck, and it seems like each time one goes out, new and exciting things are found. These expeditions out to the wreck have found and identified hundreds of tragic reminders of the ship's short career. And these include these huge bronze objects that gave Titanic her voice. In the early days, ships had relied on flags and rockets to signal each other, but this was no good in a fog. You'd have to sound a bell to let others know you were there and hope you didn't smash into anything. Then with the advent of the steam engine, ships could mount whistles that could be heard for miles. And Titanic, as the world's largest passenger ship, would need an impressive set. Only just finished and tied up at Belfast, awaiting delivery in March 1912, checks were being done all over the ship to make sure that everything was in working order. If you'd lived in Belfast at the time, You'd have been used to hearing this sound. It was the roar of an ocean liner, the voice of the Titanic. It was Smith Brothers and Co. of Heisen Green Nottingham who manufactured two sets of massive whistles for the ship. These were known as the tri-bell type of whistle. They used three domes or bells, each at different sizes, to create three different pitches of note. When steam was blasted through them, their shape meant that the sound was made and roared out for miles. The steam was fed through piping directly from the ship's main boilers, meaning that pressure was immediate and they could be sounded at a moment's notice. Every day the whistles would be tested at noon. If you look closely, you might notice that all four of Titanic's funnels have a set of whistles on them, or at least they seem to. Only the two forward sets actually worked. The other two were just dummies made up of cast iron and other bits of metal to balance out the look. The forward funnel's whistle was used for manual blasts, activated from the bridge, but the second funnel's whistles were automatic. They could be timed to go off at a regular basis, say, every day at noon. The ship's officers could engage either set from the bridge wings or the wheelhouse, and even set the timing for the second funnel's whistles from those three positions as well. The largest of the three whistle bells was 15 inches in diameter, or 38 centimetres, and stood about 4 feet or 121 centimetres tall. All up, each whistle assembly weighed in at 740 pounds, or 340 kilograms. But there was a design hurdle. Steam is, by its nature, well, wet. The condensation caused by blasting it through the whistles could damage the set and even rain down on the decks below. To counter this, Titanic's whistles were fitted with water separators which removed any fluid from the steam as it came up through the boilers. Titanic's whistles were probably sounded for the last time on the ship at noon on April the 14th, 1912, because that night 
the ship sank. The huge 65-foot funnels, each the height of a four or five-story building, were torn from their bases and collapsed, sinking to the sea floor with the whistles still attached. When the wreck was discovered, the thin metal of the funnels had corroded away, but researchers were excited to see the sets of whistles still intact on the bottom of the ocean. While one set had been broken up, the three bells all jumbled together, another set had remained intact. In 1993, the whistles were recovered by RMS Titanic Inc., a massive operation, and they were brought to the surface after decades of sitting on the sea floor. A curious and excited team set to work restoring them in the hope that they could be sounded again. In 1999, they were placed into a recording booth and tested gently with blasts of compressed air, although at a much lower pressure than the original steam would have used. The result was amazing, and briefly, Titanic's voice could be heard again for the first time after almost a hundred years. It's a remarkable and haunting thing to hear the booming chime of the ship again, and it's easy to forget, if only for a second, that the rest of it actually still rests 13,000 feet below the ocean's surface. For decades, the general consensus among experts had been that the Titanic sank in one piece, gliding gently beneath the surface. But we know today, that's not the case. Dr. Robert Ballard and his team had been shocked in 1985 to find that the ship sat in two halves, and between them was a debris field of enormous proportions. It was sad to see Titanic in this state, but the debris field provided new and unique opportunities to assess the artifacts that had survived because instead of being locked away inside the ship, they were now scattered for miles across the sea floor for any submersible to locate. Mixed up in that tangled mess of torn and bent steel and shattered crockery were intact pieces from the ship's luxurious rooms that somehow survived the breakup and monumental drop to the sea floor intact. And three of these in particular speak to the luxurious fittings that could be found throughout the ship. For her day, Titanic was famously considered the most luxurious ship afloat, but it may surprise you to learn that her interior design was somewhat austere. In the 1800s, ships had been heavily and ornately decorated. Some might say overly decorated, in a typically Victorian style. But by Titanic's time, restrained elegance was the name of the game. Artwork was relatively few and far between, but carefully chosen and a few statement pieces were used to decorate some of the most luxurious spaces. The first class lounge was situated amidships in the centre of the ship, and was one of the largest and most comfortable rooms available to passengers. It featured thick carpet, ornate wooden panelled walls, and a comprehensive library. But at the opposite end of the room, atop a fake fireplace, was fixed a small statue. So the Edwardians loved their Greek and classical histories and mythology. Titanic and Olympic themselves were named for classical figures. So it's no surprise that ancient Greek and Roman gods were chosen as popular subjects for statues and paintings for the time. Artemis was one of the most important figures of Greek mythology, and a larger-than-life marble recreation of her was crafted by the Romans in the 1st or 2nd century. It wound up on display at the Louvre in Paris, and it was frequently copied. On Titanic's lounge fireplace, a miniature recreation was placed. The savvy passengers would have recognised its origins and its significance. Sadly, the lounge was located in the exact spot that Titanic disintegrated when it broke up, and the whole room has been lost. But in 1986, when Dr. Ballard and his team were exploring the debris field, they were amazed to see the statue lying in one piece on the sea floor. It had survived the breakup of the room around it, and sailed straight down for four kilometres, 13,000 feet, to land in the silt and rest, unseen by human eyes, for 74 years. Elsewhere in the debris field was found a bronze cherub. These beautiful statues once graced the balustrades of the two first-class grand staircases, the influence of French decor and culture throughout the ship was obvious. 
The cherubs had been modelled on those found in the statues at the French palace at Versailles. This little fellow had probably been dislodged when the ship broke up, and the aft wooden staircase disintegrated, with his foot torn off where the statue had been wrenched from its base. A larger cherub had been mounted forward on the main grand staircase, but it just hasn't resurfaced. Instead, only the base has been found and recovered with the two so-called footprints showing where the cherub had once stood. The smaller cherub was recovered in 1987 and fully restored, being put on display at travelling exhibitions across the world. There was another unique feature piece from the ship that was spotted on the wreck site. Just near the after end of the bow section, the twisted remains of a candelabra were spotted. This beautiful light fixture had once sat proudly on the D-deck landing of the staircase, lit with over a dozen bulbs and glowing warmly. Passengers would have passed by it walking down the stairs on their way to dinner each night, but on the night of the sinking, it was lost. In 2010, the candelabra was spotted, twisted and broken in the sand, but it hasn't been recovered. Titanic's sister ship Olympic had an identical candelabra that was sold at auction when the ship was scrapped in the 1930s. It went into private hands and then disappeared. Recently, it was found again, heavily modified, but still working as a light fixture at a South African hotel. The remains of the gorgeous luxury fittings and art are not the only things that can tell us about Titanic's life and death. The ship's engineering was, for the time, absolutely incredible and a massive achievement. A few details on the wreck today speak to us about the way that the ship was built and operated and ultimately how it was destroyed. If you had paid a visit to the Titanic back in 1912, chances are you'd have wanted to enjoy the comfortable lounges and cafes. But as for me, well, you'd have found me down in the engine room. These incredible machines were the pinnacle of Victorian engineering. And I say Victorian, because by the time they'd been used on ships like Titanic, their heyday was drawing to a close. The Marine Triple Expansion steam engine had burst onto the scene in the mid to late 1800s, but by the turn of the century, it was largely being superseded by turbines. Titanic actually used both engine types, and a pair of triple expansion steam engines drove the ship's two outboard propellers. Triple expansion engines were reliable and easily maintained, they could pound away for hundreds and thousands of miles without needing serious overhaul. They made economic sense for the Titanic's owner's White Star Line. It's easy to imagine the ship's engineers, led by Chief Joseph Bell, gazing up at their machines with immense pride. But their condition on the wreck today tells us a sad story about how those proud and brave men lost their lives that night, and how their ship broke up from underneath them. Jutting out from the silt, Three stories tall are the remains of those immense engines. And although they look intact, they actually are not. See, these engines poke out from the exposed tear at the stern section of the ship where Titanic had ripped apart. The forces were so extreme that the massive cast bed plates that were designed to hold those hundreds of tons of engine weight in place through storms and rough weather were simply ripped apart like they were made out of cardboard. The breakup of the Titanic seems to have happened somewhere around the engine room. There's another piece of wreck that gives us a clue as to where. In two separate halves in the debris field are pieces of Titanic's double bottom. The double bottom was a well-trusted safety feature intended to prevent damage from grounding. The ship's keel and frames, its skeleton, were clad with an outer skin of steel plating. This was watertight, but the inside was plated over too creating a contained space. If the exterior skin was pierced, the inner skin would stop the ship from flooding. It was intended as a safety feature, but it also gave the Titanic an immensely strong backbone. The double bottom ran the length of the ship. It was essentially uniform in its thickness, except where the engines were mounted. Here it was reinforced to support the weight of the massive steam engines, and despite all that steel and reinforcement, on the night of the sinking, 
It was bent and shredded like wet paper. The two pieces of double bottom found in the debris field fit perfectly together like a jigsaw. A bend in the ship's keel at the center tells us that this is probably the location of the final break in the hull that tore Titanic apart. So extreme were the forces at play here that the first set of engine cylinders and their support pillars were simply ripped from the ship and tumbled to the bottom of the ocean. Today, standing like a pair of sphinxes are the two ship's main engines and what was left behind. They rear up from the ship's stern section, one of the few recognisable pieces of the entire thing. The stern hadn't properly filled with water when it was dragged down below the surface, so the pressure difference caused pockets of air to implode, stripping the interiors of their fittings and demolishing bulkheads and rooms. When it smashed to the sea floor, the stern section partially collapsed, so today the engines are just about the tallest part of the wreck here, even though they were once located way down in the belly of the ship. The stern section is just collapsing around them. But what are the engineers who once worked these incredible machines? On the night of the sinking, Chief Engineer Joseph Bell had been on duty with the engines running full speed ahead when the telegraph, which communicated orders down from the bridge, rang out with an alarming signal. All stop. From there, the engineering department was made aware of the situation and got to work. Boilers towards the stern of the ship, away from the flooding waters, were kept on to power the ship's electricity creating dynamos and keep the lights burning all night. Pumps were put to work and hoses fed through to try and clear out some of the water, but it was a losing battle. Towards the very end, with steam pressure dying and Titanic's lights beginning to glow red, Chief Engineer Bell released his men and told them to abandon ship. By then, of course, all of the lifeboats had gone, so by the time they appeared on deck, it was too late. Not one of Titanic's engineers or electricians survived the night, but thanks to their efforts, the ship sank on an even keel and the lights burned until almost the very last second. It must have been strange for Titanic's engine room to come to a sudden and complete standstill. Many passengers had got used to the rumble of the engines and were awakened, not by the iceberg impact, but by the stillness of the ship when they had stopped. Today, the engines, pistons, and enormous connecting rods are frozen in time in the positions they were left the moment Chief Engineer Bell ordered them stopped 110 years ago. Sprawling across the sea floor is that debris field 15 square miles, or almost 40 square kilometers large. It more resembles the site of a great air crash and sits in perfect blackness Still, frozen, and calm, at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, interrupted only every few years by the harsh light of curious submarines. What else lies down there, jumbled on the seafloor? What other stories can the Titanic's debris field tell us? Well, next time we'll look at some more pieces of the Titanic wreck, and how they can speak to the life and death of history's greatest maritime legend. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.